Yesterday, I did a video about the amazing new feature, which is the Zoom apps that lets you integrate Mural and Miro and Timers and Mentimeter and Kahoot and a bunch of other apps right within the Zoom app. But after doing some more research, here's five reasons why you should not be using the Zoom apps yet. So if you haven't watched this video, I'll post a link up here. Zoom introduced this brand new feature where you can add all these third-party integrations right in your Zoom app. And I thought this is an amazing tool where instead of sending participants a link in the chat and they click it and then they get sent off to their browser, this would keep them within the app, within the platform, and I will risk losing a lot less people in the process. But I think there's certain scenarios where you don't want to use the apps that you love right within Zoom. And I'll share those five reasons today. The first one is, is maybe the biggest one. As I was trying to install a couple of the Zoom apps yesterday, because there is a bit of a process to it, I realized that you need the permission of the account owner. So let me show you what that means. I'm in my Zoom app right now, and you can see I've already installed a bunch of apps on the right-hand side here. You can actually access them through the Apps button, but I did a whole different video about this uh, on my channel, which you can check out. But if I want to add a new tool, let's... Uh, add this one, for example. It will take you to the website, and here it will ask you to authorize how to use this app. So the difficult thing is that for this to work, you need to, one, be logged into your Zoom account. So you need to have your own Zoom account. If you have participants, you usually just sign in as a guest. Uh, this will not work. They actually have to create their own account with name and password. Number two, if you're working with an organization that might have an account owner that is different to the participants that will be joining, meaning they have to ask for permission from the account owner to authorize each and every single app. So when you're working with organizations, that sometimes might mean, okay, they have to check in with their IT department or they have to check in with their manager or boss to make sure that that is enabled. And again, this needs to happen for every single app. So if you're planning to use this feature, make sure you know kind of what the restrictions are for your participants. And if that is something they need to do way ahead of your meeting, your event, your workshop, Make sure you communicate that very well. Um, all right, the next thing is kind of similar. Updates are required. So um, yes, when you want to use all of these new features, pretty much any new Zoom feature, you need to make sure that you are on the most recent Zoom update. So if your participants have not updated their app in a while, they might not be able to see those features and be able to use it. Uh, there is one way how you can force and require all of your participants to update their app before they can join your meeting. Uh, I'll post a link to that video here. But the challenge is that sometimes that means they can't actually join your event at all. And we don't want them to feel like they're missing out, right? All right, the third one and this is a big one, is privacy issues. So um, one thing that when you browse the marketplace on the Zoom website, you will see is uh, actually you've even seen it when I try to authorize this new app, it will actually tell you what type of content uh, or what type of access each app has, has to what you're sharing, like participant profile and contact information. Um, the content, including audio, video, messages, transcriptions, feedback, polls, files, right? So for some people, that seems like it's a lot of pr private information that this third-party app now get ac gets access to. And 
that might be a deal breaker for some. Uh, I've done a little bit more research since this came out just yesterday and found this one support page about the Active Apps Notifier. I'll actually post a link to that in the description of this video. Um, this kind of outlines a little bit more about the transparency that Zoom is actually providing. And here's why, why I think this is actually the best way for them to do it. So a lot of these third-party apps need a lot of permissions to be able to use the features um, that they provide. And rather than burying all of that information in fine print, where you have to click a link, go to a different page, and scroll through pages and pages of very small text where they share how they're planning to use your information, Zoom actually decided to be transparent about it and show you all of that information. So for some people, um, seeing a page like this might actually be really scary, but I think it's actually adding to the transparency. And uh, the one thing that they also show on this page here, for anybody who wants to read all of the different uh, things here, you can actually see which apps are being used on your account. And um, if somebody else in your meeting is using an app that requires them to share information of the meeting, you can also see that. But what will these apps do with the information they collect? I'll actually read you this paragraph. Um, Each host and third-party app is governed by its own terms of service, privacy policy, and support information. Zoom does not determine how hosts or apps may choose to share content, so we encourage our users to review that information carefully on each app's marketplace page in the privacy policy and terms of use sections. So let's go to our uh, Zoom marketplace and click on one of the apps. And this is where we can get a lot more information about uh, what they do. And you can read all of the details of what they require and how they're planning to use it here. And then at the bottom here, there is uh, there are links to each developer's privacy policy. So if you want to see how each app is actually using the data that they're collecting, you can uh, review all of that here. And um, I like to think that, yes, although they might get access to a lot of the information, they each developer has their own privacy policy, they, their own terms of uh, and conditions. So if that's something that is important to you, I highly recommend that you check that out. And this is how you can access it on the Zoom marketplace. Again, I will link to that in the comments below. Now, the Next one is compatibility. And this one is still yet to be kind of seen. This is uh, July 22nd, 2021. The Zoom apps were just released for the desktop app yesterday. As of right now, if you're using your phone, if you're using an iPad, if you're using your browser, you're not able to use the Zoom apps yet. So if you participants are joining from different devices, they will not be able to use all of the functionality. And uh, that's, again, something good for you to keep in mind as you're maybe planning of using some of those apps. So uh, what I usually do is make sure that you share with your participant if it's required to join via, via desktop or via a laptop because that way you can make sure that they're all able to use those, those features. And uh, the last thing with compatibility is also having a backup plan. And I'll, I'll share with you here. Um, let me go back to my Zoom app. Uh, one of the apps I actually use a lot is something like Mentimeter. And Mentimeter is a great tool to do quick surveys and polls and do fun little word clouds. And one thing, um, let me actually just find one here. Um, this is one survey I did for my facilitator community on niching and kind of the feelings around it. And um, usually when I, when I use this, I would now click share. And now this is being shared with all of the participants. And if they have the Mentimeter app installed on their Zoom, they can actually see um, 
right within the app a field where they can enter their answer. The challenging thing is if they don't have the Zoom app installed or if they use a browser or a different device, the backup plan is I can still use the code. So you can see on the top here um, for Mentimeter to access any, um, any survey, any poll, they can just enter the code either on their phone by going to menti.com or I can actually copy the link. And I really like how when I hover my mouse over here, it just says copy a link. And then I can go to the chat, paste that link in the chat, and now kind of the same way I did before, before the Zoom apps were a thing, everybody can open that up in a browser and then enter their information right here. So I don't think that uh, the learning curve is that big. Uh, sorry, the, the compatibility compatibility issue is such a big issue if you know what your backup plan is. Um, all right. And the fifth reason why I think you should not be using the Zoom apps, or at least be careful when you use them, is the idea of the learning curve. So um, let me jump back into Zoom. So one thing that is required for each participant before they're able to use the Zoom apps is to go to the website, authorize it, and yes, they make it really easy. If, um, for example, I'm using, um, let's say, Kahoot, which is a fun uh, app to to create little quizzes and and uh, and polls. If I click that send button up here, it will actually send a message to everybody in their Zoom app that just gives them the access, uh, the option to view the app and then directly install it. So the steps are, they're trying to minimize the steps, yet it's still a step. They have to click the button, uh, see the app, add to Zoom. They will be sent to the website where they have to log in. They have to be the account owner to be able to authorize the app. Then they have to come back. If this is the very first time they're using Zoom apps, they might have to restart their app for it to show up. So there are a few steps that just are there in general. And then if you're using things like Mural and Miro, like those are great, great tools. Uh, see, like now it's sending me to the website. I need to sign in. Um, can't really show you everything right now. But some of those apps by themselves have much larger learning curves. So you can't, um, yeah, it, if, if you're planning to use these apps, keep in mind that if you're using them just for a one off uh, workshop, like where it's the same group of people only together once, maybe it's not worth going through the whole trouble of adding the zoom app to each person's um, zoom. Oh, I have <laughs> lost because I joined with my free account. I have lost my uh, my Zoom meeting ended um, because I was trying out how because I couldn't log in. I used my free one. So the one thing to keep in mind is yes, if there is a group that you're only working together once, maybe just sharing a link in the chat to have people access the website to enter quick information, come back to Zoom is enough. But if you're using the same group of people. Uh, if you're working with the same group of people on an ongoing basis, then teaching them once, once they have installed the app once, they don't have to go through all the steps again. And the second time you find, you meet them on Zoom, they already have it installed. You can just start uh, and jump right in. So uh, all with that, I want to make sure that if you are planning to use a Zoom apps, you start playing around with it, you start experimenting. There's so many apps that I'm still yet to explore. So make sure you subscribe to my channel and check out some of the other videos where I show you some more details on how these Zoom apps work and which ones are my favorites. All right, talk to you soon. Bye.